Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. students. <clears throat> so this lecture is about basal ganglia. Uh, before we dive into this, uh, a few disclaimers. Uh, a lot less is known about basal ganglia and as we go forwards uh, with, uh, with the functions of basal ganglia. Uh, the way they, they, they come together and assist the motor system. Most of the stuff given in Guyton uh, is with uh, the, the, the preconditions of perhaps, maybe, most probably. Uh, so uh, much of it is inferred information and not confirmed information. Uh, so a lot of questions that, that arise sometimes uh, while going through uh, this, uh, this particular topic uh, right now don't have an answer. Uh, just like in uh, motor cortex up next, uh, this is the next topic. Most of the stuff that happens in the frontal cortex, uh, particularly frontal cortex, which makes us uh, what we are, Ashraf al makhlukat i.e. humans, i.e. the highest placed uh, living creatures, um, it's not known what the, the frontal cortex, the, the, the details, the exact details, the precise uh, points is not clear. Uh, most of the stuff is inferred or hypothesized theories and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> from this point onwards, uh, it will be a bit of a la la land <laughs> as far as uh, detailed science inquiries concerned. However, uh, since it, the basal ganglia coming back to this point, since basal ganglia generates one of the most prolific and profound and famous diseases called Parkinson's, uh, a functional understanding of its uh, of its physiology uh, is essential uh, to understand how Parkinson's is uh, is uh, uh, comes into comes into being. So this is that intro. With this intro, as usual, as I did with uh, cerebellum, uh, I concentrated on uh, the functions. I keep, kept on repeating it so that you remember it. And so this exactly is what I'm going to do now. For basal ganglia, I will literally before anatomy, I will start with the function because remember the first headline, of course, is the most important one. You need to remember that basal ganglia has an overall inhibitory function in CNS, in the motor system. Uh, generally, the motor output is under a, a barrage of uh, inhibitory impulses from the top down. I, I've been saying this since the beginning of uh, this lecture series. Uh, and today <clears throat> we come to the specific point where this inhibition is generated in its most part. That is the basal ganglia. So while motor cortex and cerebellum is, is, main, is mainly to do with exciting things or turning them on uh, and of course switching them off as well. But the journal uh, how should I say it? the general paradigm of inhibition is gener generated by the basal ganglia uh, the background you know if you start painting you you get a you get a you get a paper or a canvas uh, and then you paint on it okay so if I may say it carefully uh, metaphorically speaking basal ganglia may qualify to be a bit of the canvas here if uh, we are talking about motor control. So if you're talking about motor control, basal ganglia is the background, the, the, the quiet background, not so quiet, but you don't get to uh, see it specifically in action because it, 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 it assists the brain, it assists the motor uh, bosses, the motor areas uh, in, in a way that they don't overshoot. They don't do too much of the excitation. So it, it, it keeps things well into in a range on a canvas in that sort of sense. Okay, so with this, uh, let's just get rid of this if we can. So that we have more covering area. There we go. So it inhibits muscle tone throughout the body. Now this is obviously something which is new to you. Uh, we, 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 we did how muscle tone is, is made. So it's a continuous motor discharge uh, throughout uh, the muscles 
via the CNS. However, now we are studying that basal ganglia actually works against that and keeps it again within physiological limits. So it actually inhibits uh, uh, muscle tone. And remember, as I go along the normal function of the basal ganglia, you should automatically think in, in the clinical sense that, okay, hold on. If it inhibits the muscle tone throughout the body, what happens when it's not working? Yeah, it would increase the muscle tone. So people with Parkinson's have very high muscle tone because the inhibitor is switched off, right? Number two, selects and maintains purposeful. So the, the point here is purposeful. I've mentioned this uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a comment uh, while we were discussing cerebellum, that uh, cerebellum uh, does, uh, deals with the, the tremor of cerebellum is in, intention tremor. Uh, and, and, and some comment that I made about the, the movement being purposeful over there. However, here, uh, you, you see that both worlds come together. So, the cerebellum, it selects, the, the word is select, keep that in mind, and maintains. These are, we will go into details, this is just an introduction of this function. Selects and maintains purposeful motor activity. Okay. So, it keeps in mind, mind, uh, what is the most graceful and efficient uh, 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 collection of motor movements uh, done before in whatever uh, atmosphere you're in, whatever situation you're in, and it suggests the motor cortex that look, take this, take this pattern of movement. Okay, remember it deals with pattern of movements. So it selects and maintains purposeful patterns of motor movement while very importantly suppresses the useless and the unwanted ones, patterns of movement. Okay. Number three, it helps monitor, coordinate, slow, sustain contraction, especially. So posture and support comes, men is mentioned again. This is uh, again an important point. So it helps and monitors slow, sustained contractions uh, of the mainly the anti-gravity muscles and so on and so forth. So these are the three overview uh, functions of the basal ganglia okay they do not directly influence any motor neuron so that's that should be clear uh, neither does cerebellum these are indirect uh, indirect systems accessory systems which run in the background typically cerebellum now you know that basal ganglia also uh, although in the hierarchy is higher up so it's in the in the planning sort of uh, level uh, cerebellum is at the planning and execution level uh, so is basal ganglia but basal ganglia's connection with the boss the cerebral cortex is much much more extensive plus it stores uh, in it patterns of movement which it gives to the motor cortex which then the cortex just uh, issues you know it just pushes them forward uh, so definitely it has a higher order uh, place in the hierarchy of the motor the whole motor chain uh, but it direct, doesn't directly do anything really, it just suggests, okay? Uh, rather than um, uh, acting on, any, on anything, it actually modifies what is already being done or already what should be done. If I were to summarize cerebellum, how would I su su uh, summarize cerebellum? S certain keywords should come to your mind now. Repetitive movements. Ballistic movements, motor learning. Remember that image, finger nose test. What a cute girl thing. Okay? Those images were there for a reason so that your mem memory stand. Okay? So remember those pictures, balance. Remember the guy who was standing on one leg? So balance. This is all cerebellum. Basal ganglia deals with patterns of movement. Not individual movements, but it. patterns. What is a pattern of movement? What is a complex movement? Anything which is beyond five seconds. So if you are doing, and generally, most of our daily routine movements are complex movements. So if it involves multiple muscle groups, and if it goes beyond five seconds, 
you are almost de you should be definite that basal ganglia is behind it. Yes. So if you forget everything about basal ganglia, please remember this. It deals with patterns, not individual stuff. Secondly, achha, all patterns. So not just ballistic movements or this movement or that movement. No, it just deals with everything. Every complex thing that you have done behind was basal ganglia. Okay, so that's one. I want you to remember. What was that? Is there is a cognitive function here? So, what is cognition? Quickly. Identifying something you've learned before. Something else. Something more generic. Cognition. What does the word cognition mean? Thinking. Anything to do with thinking, memory, thought processes, etc., etc. Every motor thing that you do has a thought behind it. By the way, so cognition is wired into basal ganglia. Right. In fact, there are two circuits in basal ganglia which we we'll study. One totally focuses on cognitive cognitive processes of the brain, dealing with cognition. Okay. So literally, this example you will find in guide the following example: If you see a lion approach you, or uh, just a lion, lion approach you, what would you do? Come on. You will not stay quiet and be stationary objects like you are right now. You will obviously run for your life. This pause here. The running for the life is not towards the line now, is it? <laughs> obviously, it's away from that thing. At maximum speed, and if you find a, a rock or a, a whatever, a high place, you want to climb there. You will do that. This is the punching punch line here. You will do it instinctively. It's like an instinct in you. You see some danger, like a lion or whatever. You will instinctively go into a set of motions, not told to you. They are like your nature. This deep instinct, motor instinct, is again. What are they? These are the group. Obviously, the word ganglia. Or nuclei, basal nuclei, basal ganglia are the same thing as you will be studying in anatomy. These are a group of deeply placed, highly interrelated subcortical nuclei. They are an accessory motor system. Uh, most of the input and output is from and to cerebral cortex. So they have extensive linkages to and fro uh, between uh, cerebral cortex and basal ganglia. Uh, now we come to the anatomy. Of course, this is this won't be an extensive anatomy class. Uh, so in anatomy, if you see this this uh, lateral view, it gives you a pretty good idea of where is what. And I like this image because uh, what he has done is he's uh, sort of made this uh, these hemispheres uh, transparent to show you the deeply placed nuclei. Uh, this uh, the the basal nuclei okay so this here this here this whole thing this structure oops sorry this whole structure this here is the basal ganglia now obviously there are limitations of this diagram because it's a lateral diagram and they, it's not it's not a cut section he's just made the uh, hemispheres uh, transparent to show you the uh, deep nuclei uh, uh, inside, but we do get some data from it. Uh, firstly, we obviously know that this is anterior, this is posterior, and this is lateral. And we are looking at the at the at the basal ganglia from the lateral side. Nothing is cut; it's just as 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 they are. Okay. So what you see is this part here. Let me just remove this. Just follow my cursor. This part here is on our side. Where we are where we are looking at so it is the left side left hemisphere okay so this is the basal ganglia of the left side that this whole thing okay this is called the caudate the caudate nucleus this is the putamen and globus pallidus why two words well this is the putamen and behind this is the global pallidus pallidus cannot be shown here but we will we will look at the uh, cross section uh, soon in the next slide and you can see here what he has done is cleverly 
he has shaded it lightly because this is self the thalamus peaking from behind the putamen and the globus pallidus okay so it's thalamus then on the outside it's uh, putamen and global pallidus and overarching is the caudate nucleus with its tail the new the, the tail of the caudate nucleus coming here and this is the amygdala which is not marked here which we'll study in a bit so this is about it uh, one less one one thing one thing more is this 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 what is this these branches that that are radiating literally in a, in a sunrise kind of radiation okay this is these are cortical fibers descending cortical tracts remember corticospinal tract this is that along with other cortical fibers they come from the cortex and then pass through the basal ganglia on towards the brain stem how exactly and where do they go uh, through if you remember the descending co uh, cortical uh, descending motor system lecture where i was met, uh, talking about uh, uh, the corticospinal tract i mentioned a place called if you remember internal capsule so uh, imagine that the internal capsule is here is here somewhere okay we will we will look at it in a bit more detail so this diagram is from genong it's pretty descriptive uh, i like this it's simple as well it can it can be actually made uh, if you want to make it um, uh, in physiology not in anatomy anatomy uh, requires more detail uh, so this is uh, the first diagram it it goes again it gives you the lateral view uh, this is caudate nucleus um, i beg your pardon did i cover the nuclei sorry so these are the uh, five nuclei which are included in basal ganglia caudate putamen global pallidus we've done that substantia nigra has not been shown here we will show it show it to you in a bit and subthalamic nuclei also cannot be shown in this view it will be shown in this view okay now so uh, caudate nucleus is this it's a this big whole caudate nucleus it loops around the rest of the basal ganglia then becomes thin we call it the tail of the uh, caudate nucleus which ends into a, a, a another nucleus which is called the amygdala or amygdaloid nucleus okay now within this within this whole thing you see the the thalamus on the inner side peeking through and the dashed line telling you that it is behind this particular lobe this whole thing here and this is the as i as i mentioned putamen and globus globus pallidus so this is on the lateral most side on the inner side you have the thalamus okay now <clears throat> this is more much more descriptive in the sense that it gives you the exact location of uh, globus pallidus and putamen so what is this we this is the horizontal section so what he has done to this diagram is horizontal cut it like this so something like this this is oops this is the cut and this is the view right so we've cut it like this and show it to you in the horizontal section now in the horizontal section you see that the caudate nucleus obviously will be cut and will look like this the since the cut is at this level the tail also will be shown and it's shown like this i hope this is clear the thalamus which was peaking inside now comes in broad daylight this is the big thalamus placed medially and on the outer side the outermost side you had the putamen on the inner side you had the globus pallidus so now you can study properly uh, that this is the relation of putamen and globus pallidus uh, and very importantly and crucially you see the, the you see the internal capsule placed right here in between the thalamus the caudate and the globus pallidus okay a very important thing is shown here and i will ask you a question what extra is shown here internal capsule <clears throat> what is the importance of internal capsule this should be answered hands one one a class which will go into props in about 
I don't know. <laughs> Through pension crops so that people wake up. Udar se kuch bachone ka baat kare ki idhar please. Okay, that's one. What else? There is a very big clinical significance of internal capsule. I have discussed it. Yes. Thank you. Now, get what? Pause. 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 One of the most commonest sites of strokes, CVAs, strokes, internal capsule. Why? I told you that too. Because it's a very narrow place. What has this got to do with the stroke, by the way? What passes through this? Thank you. Some people remember the corticospinal tract. I am very tempted to ask you what is the corticospinal tract, but no. So the corticospinal tract passes through this along with other cortical descending fibers. It's a very narrow place. Here it's it's very lavishly given. It's a very narrow place with tiny, tiny blood vessels. So those blood vessels can rupture relatively easier than the other stuff of the brain. That's why this is the vulnerable point for hemorrhages. Remember that it's called capsular stroke. And here I am telling you this capsular stroke. Very common. An examiner can ask you, mistaking you for a good student, okay, can ask you, Bete, what is capsular stroke? I want you to hit that ball out of the stadium. This is more detailed than what we had here, and this is this one is much more detailed than this. This is a frontal section now. So what he has done is he has cut it like like this. So this cut is shown here, frontal section. Okay. So cut it like this and showed it to you like this okay now you see a a lot of stuff which will go slowly now this is the midline this is the midline okay this is one uh, hemisphere one part of the brain half part of the brain okay for the chap it would be the left side of the brain and this is the right side of the hemisphere, right hemisphere, right side of the brain. Okay, basal ganglia are in are in pairs, are in a pair, so you will have it on the left side and the right side. Okay, so we'll we'll see what is on the patient's left side, starting from the outermost point. This is the putamen. So now you can place this diagram over here. Okay, this is the putamen. This now is the globus pallidus and now you see that actually globus pallidus has two components an external component and an internal component okay this is the external component this is the internal component putamen external component segment of the globus pallidus internal segment of the globus pallidus done this is the nucleus uh, Cordit nucleus uh, cut obviously so it will appear like this okay and now you can see the relation between the lateral ventricle which is part of the ventricle system you will study this anatomy so it's, it's it's closely associated with the lateral ventricle and now we come to the uh, medial structures so this is the thalamus this is the thalamus as you can see okay and this little little thing here right here light brown let me just magnify this okay subthalamic nucleus this little brown thing subthalamic because this is the thalamus and this is below it tucked away below it very small area but very important in terms of connections okay and below that this very light thing here I will give it due protocol and label it properly Oops. this this is the substantia nigra now why did i make a bit of a fuss about this label it like in with such a big red arrow 
is because substantia nigra is the reason behind Parkinson's disease. So please remember this. It's a small area in front of the other big areas of the basal ganglia. This is relatively obviously a small area. But substantia nigra is a very important area clinically. Okay. This is the reference if for people who want to study this particular material. Circles of, circles of basal ganglia. Now this very complex looking slide you don't have to learn anything about. It. I just wanted to tell you that this is physiology. Look at anatomy, nice structure, this, that, whatever. But it doesn't mean anything. Everything is just placed there and they'll tell you it's here. It's literally like telling the second, second year class, where are they physically? They're here. Where are they functionally? Ah. Where are their brains? Well, don't ask. This is physiology. Look at the number of arrows in this diagram. There is a, there is a method to this madness, I'll tell you. But first, just, just look at it. Look at the number of arrows going here, there, everywhere. Now, if you want to make sense of it, just look at now the boxes. So look at the box which says muscles, and it's not here. <laughs> there is a box here, it says muscles. Okay, so stuff obviously is coming to the to the muscles at, as, as the end point and stuff which is originating from the muscles. Okay, this stuff here is the are the motor bosses, mainly the motor cortex, the thalamus, the red nucleus. You, I hope, remember red nucleus. This here is the basal ganglia. This, so you you can have some navigation of this sort of thing. The only reason I'm showing you this, Dayton also mentions this diagram as a reference point in some lines because you cannot possibly explain this diagram. But it's to show you the gravity of the connections that basal ganglia has with the motor system. That's it. This is the two things. And then we'll look at a, a bunch of pictures and we'll be off. Again, I'll be coming back to this slide uh, in bits tomorrow. Just right now, I want you to, I want to tell you, show you, there are two circuits of the basal ganglia. When I say circuits, what I mean? I mean Lego blocks, Lego blocks, blocks. I give you a few blocks and ask you to make a train. You make a train. Half of the class are given blocks. They make a train out of it. The rest of the class, I ask you to any object dinosaur from those blocks blocks are the same blocks are the same but you made a train you made something else so basal ganglia is actually wired in two different ways the same nuclei but internal wiring is like a switchboard one switch uh, handles the fan the other handles the light or whatever but it's in the same board. That's a good example as well. So these are the two ways which basal ganglia are wired together to give you optimal motor function. This is called the putamen circuit. The one on your left, okay? And this here is the cordic circuit. You can actually tell by looking which one is the busiest. Putamen is the busiest in this diagram. Even if you're sitting right at the back, you can tell that this is putamen circuit. Why? Because it, putamen is the most heaviestly, heavy, heavily hit area in this circuit. Look at this putamen. Look at the putamen here. Not much going on, but look at the quadrant. So it's a, it's a tell sign of which circuit it is. So one is putamen circuit, putamen is the hero of the circuit, the other is quadrate, quadrate is the hero of the circuit. Very simple. This, all those patterns of movement that we were talking about, I'll show you some patterns of movement and inshallah you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy it. The pictures. So this is patterns of movement. Putamen circuit, P for putamen, P for patterns, patterns of movements executing them, helping the cortex get complex stuff done. C for quadrant, C for cognition. Cognition, I mentioned cognition, the appropriateness of stuff. 
this circuitry, right? So complex movements, all of them, most of them, where to do them? Coordinate circuit. Yes. We will tomorrow do a bit of detail of each, and then we we'll move on to the clinical stuff. But well, let's look at a bunch of pictures now. What do you see? A person, whatever you call it. What do you, there's a slang for it. Dunk, dunk. What's this? Scissors. The person kept cutting the scissors. These are not random. Just keep a note of this. Next, please. Who is a cat person? Who is a dog person? Well, I'm both. I don't I like both. Who said you can just like one? Who are you, the rest of you? What do you like? <laughs> Lizards and mice? <mines? laughs> okay. No, I couldn't find an eye movement bunny picture. Obviously, it's I can't. I had to play a video. But just imagine that the cat is moving its eyes. Just imagine that. These images are royalty free, brothers. I can use them. This is a guy shouting. Okay? Prof, near prof situation of people who take it easy. This guy. So shouting, i.e., vocalization. So all of these pictures, okay, all of these pictures, one or the basketball thing, blah, blah, blah. The second one, scissors. cutting with scissors, the handling the whole thing, hammering a nail. Third picture was the cat. Yeah. Moving the eyes in an intelligent fashion. Okay. And this guy, vocalization, shouting, vocalization, speaking, whispering, all the aspects of vocalization. All of them, putamen circuit. All of these are complex movements. All of them have putamen circuit behind them. Don't get me wrong. I'll repeat it. It's not the putamen circuit that does it, but putamen circuit assists the motor areas, the main motor areas, to rather than cutting it scissors like this, let's do it with a single hand. That rather than hitting your fingers with the hammer, hit the head of the damn nail. Right? If you want to speak in this class, speak in a low tone. The only one shouting needs to be the guy who's paid for it, and so on and so forth. So, all complex movements that you do, once again, parting moments and uh, last words is putamen circuit. Putamen circuit helps execute complex movements, multiple muscle groups, more than five seconds of duration. 